Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I'm so glad I'm among the redeemed. Doesn't make me any better than anybody else, but it sure helps me to be prepared for heaven and to be able to help people. And so I, I, I thank God for this shifting in, in uh, the, the church uh, in the book of Acts. If you have the 13th chapter, if you have your Bibles for Acts, I want to share a few verses with you. Now in the church, there was at Antioch there certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, whose surname is Niger, Lucius of, of Serene, and Marcion, who had been brought up with Herod the Terek and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord, and they fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, and laying hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they were called to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island of Papas, they found a certain sorcerer, a, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. And the man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, translated, um, you know, sorcerer, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away in faith, away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, not tiptoeing through the tulips, and said, Oh, you are full of deceit, and you're full of fraud. You're the son of the devil, and you're the enemy of unrighteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately, say immediately with me, and immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he had saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to preach a message this morning, and, and we're going to add one more. If you have your bulletins, some of the learning points, there is an additional one, and you'll see that up there. Um, and inadvertently, all five didn't get in there. But I want to preach your message this morning. This world needs Jesus. Would you agree with me? This is a messed up, mixed up world. And we must have a heart for missions. You're going to see the strategic change here in the missionary vision for not only just Jerusalem, but Judea. Not only just for the Jew, but for the Greek and, and through ev to, to everyone that breathes God's air. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, know one thing. That if it would have been just you, he still would have gone to the cross for you. You say, but I'm messed up. We were all messed up. Hey, have you ever tried to change yourself and get yourself all firm and fancy and all this kind of stuff? Only to mess up more? Come on. Am I preaching to a truthful crowd today? Not just Pastor Wayne here. He died for you and he was resurrected for you and he lives for you. And you say, I can't. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So we see here a strategic move in Acts 13. It begins with the third phase of growth in this young church. It's exciting to see it. From Acts 1 to Acts 8. It describes the witness of Jerusalem. The second aspect that we've been talking about before in Acts 8 to Acts 12, it carries the account of the gospel being spread in Judea, Samaria, and beyond Palestine. Now, as we continue this series in chapters 13 to 28, it tells us how the Christian witness reached the Gentile outside of the world of Judaism. Yes, we are to go to the Jew first. But how many are glad that Jesus sought you out and you sought him out? He didn't say you didn't save yourself, he saved you. Is there anybody in the house that's glad they're saved today and he sought you and he bought you with his precious blood? 
the ministry of Philip. I want to reiterate this in Samaria. Remember when he ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch, and after he did, he was, he was translated. And, and also remember in Acts 8, the martyrdom of Stephen. So, so at an early, early phase in this young church, they became missionary-minded. I'm here to tell you we cannot gloat upon the pictures, uh, uh, on the finances uh, that we have on the wall out there and shrink back and say, that's enough for missionaries. We, 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 uh, I have missionaries calling me all the time. And I don't want to ever have to say no. Sometimes I do. We have a young couple that are going to Africa that are going to be with us in March. They're going to come and share their testimony. As a pastor, I don't feel to give a window. I feel to give that service for them because that's their heart. And we need to hear their hearts cry and we need to hear their passion. So here in Acts 13, it records the first account, I want you to get this, of an organized foreign missionary outreach. Don't miss this. We're going to get into some detail, but we need detail. This, this, is, the, this is the shift. This is the paradigm shift. I am praying that this church I was so challenged when, when, when my, my fellow uh, district pastor preached the missions convention here. I came under conviction. I was sobbing. And I said, God, I don't want to gloat in what we have here. I don't want to look at the financial tapestry of the world and even where we are financially. You're bigger than all of that. We must be a world missionary church focused on sending forth people to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, that is, that, is, that is paramount for us. That is so important. We must pay attention to that. The emphasis now is essentially on the ministry to the Gentiles. God is pushing His church outside of Jerusalem and bringing them to Antioch, to the uttermost parts of the world. I believe God wants to give this church a Holy Spirit push, that we will push beyond the parameters that we have, and we will go forward. Mighty in battle, strong warriors for the Lord. Hallelujah. Giving to His work like never before. Jerusalem represented the, the, the home church. That's, that's us, beloved, NLCC, and ho uh, home missions. And then, and then it went into Jerusalem and Judea, and Judea and Samaria. Then Antioch represents the extension of the gospel to the ends of the world. What is that? It's foreign missions. Right here. You see, why do we do these things? We do, we do missions because it's biblical. We, we, we raise up leaders and we, and we disciple them and we send missionaries to the ends of the earth so that the gospel might be heard by everyone. Beloved, I'm so glad that I heard the gospel as a teenager in high school and finally after being rebellious, settled, settled the, the account and said yes to Jesus. Although have I always been perfect? No, I haven't. Have I sinned? You're right, I haven't. So haven't you. But the Bible says when we do, we have an advocate of the Father, and we can cry out to Him. <laughs> I don't want to hear how bad you got it, and how, how, I don't want to hear how, 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 how much you've gone through. I, I do. Jesus cares about that. But I want you to hear one thing. No matter what it is, God is greater. God is greater. You're not a biological bomb. You're somebody. You're God's creation. In His infinite wisdom and His mercy and the grandeur, all of God Almighty, He set you apart and He put His stamp on you and now you are a Jesus follower. That happened because of missions. Missions. And we will not shrink back as a church. We have taken budgets. We have taken uh, missionaries where, where we have not. We've been short in our missions and we've taken it in our general fund over the years. Not to say we can't support you once we promised we were going to, but now things are tough and so we can't. I don't believe that's what God wants. You can't leave somebody on foreign soil and even home soil. So the main truth that I want us to grasp today is this. Please get it. The Holy Spirit guides and he empowers Christians to spread the gospel. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We cannot do this in and of ourselves. It's the Spirit of God whoo, breathing on us and beckoning us to answer the call that he's placed before us. I want us first to understand, here's some, here's some takeaways, to understand the role of the local church in, in, in sending and, and supporting missionaries, to, to understand how God calls workers, 
Three, to face opposition with, with, with the assurance that God will bless the efforts of those who are doing His work. Make no mistake about it. Hallelujah. And the fourth was one you don't have in your bulletin. To understand the importance of missions. And number five, to take steps to support the missionary work of the church. That's the goal today of this message. And I pray the Holy Ghost will hone it in on our hearts and lives and, and, and make us be drawn closer to Him. First of all, I want you to look at verses 1 through 4. Hang with me today. Called by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> called by the Holy Spirit. Anybody here today called by the Holy Spirit? Amen. you got to be to get up in the morning to come out to church. Amen. We're called by the Holy Spirit, and we see it here. Simeon, that was called Niger, believed uh, that, 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 that he actually came from Serene, and he, it was an African settlement. And his surname, Niger, um, suggests of an African descent. And also, some may feel that this could be the Simeon that carried Jesus' cross. We don't know for sure. But remember, the one that was Simeon that was called to carry Jesus' cross because it was heavy. And, and a missionary church. The first missionary journey starts from Antioch, the city where the gospel was first preached to the Gentiles. And that's, that's in Acts 11, 20. And remember, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And this young church grew in numbers and power and spectacularly. It was, it was supplied with a number of ministries and a, and a number of, of ministry gifts that God had bestowed upon that church. There, there, there were prophets that, that would have special messages of edification and exhortation and comfort. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 14.3 when we talk about the gifts of the church. That God gifts His church with, with people like that. And then also we see that they were gifted with teachers and instructors and, and believers in righteousness and, and to share the written word or to share the word of God and the sayings of Christ. And Barnabas was sent to Antioch by the church in Jerusalem. I pray that this church, New Life Christian Church, will, will, New Life Christian Assembly, will be a sending church like never before. There should be an amen there. Hallelujah. That we will be a sending church. Oh, listen, it's, it, it, you, God will take care of the budget. You know, there are some things we just need. We need to count the cost before you build the building. I understand that. We need to be frugal in all avenues. But we need to have faith, too. Faith that of a grain of a mustard seed. Say unto that mountain, be removed, and it will be cast yonder into the sea. And so God has called this church. See, Pastor Wayne, what was the secret success of this church in Antioch? It wasn't that they had a slick building, that they had the bestest, best worship team or the best preacher or the best staff on planet Earth. You know what the focal point was? They were soul winners. They were soul winners. It's been fun. I don't want these. I don't want these altars to be barren. I don't want these altars to be barren any longer. I want on every single service we have right here in the meeting place and out there in the marketplace, here weekly, daily, people getting saved and, and set free by the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. God doesn't want his altars to be barren. And so that was the key. And what did they do? They, they discipled them. Then they sent them. The church in Antioch, and I pray it will be like us, they were responsive to the Holy Spirit. That's what I felt, beloved. That's what I felt at our missions convention. I was moved upon by the Holy Spirit powerfully. I was leaving after that. I had all my bags packed to go to Maine hunting. And I, I, was, just, I, was, just moved, I was just weeping. Why? Because I felt the Holy Spirit saying, no, you and Gail can do more. Oh, I know some people get hung up on this. People leave churches because when you start talking about finances, people, they just, they just evacuate the premises and, and uh, they cease to stand on the promises. But God provides. I believe every one of us can give to missions. We give to McDonald's. We give to Burger Kings. We give to the steakhouses. We give to every other place. You say, Pastor, how am I going to make it? Well, I'll tell you what, you'll make it just fine without one cup of coffee. God is a provider. He's an awesome provider. 
Oh, I, I felt challenged all over in this message, studying and going over this. I want the Holy Spirit to touch us. They became uh, the center of the, of the Gentile Christianity and, 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 and world evangelism. They had a missionary call. I submit to you, this church and you and I individually, we have a missionary call. We have people here that are called by God. I couldn't run from that call. You can't run from that call. God calls us. He calls us and ordains us that we should bring forth fruit. That he might be glorified. It was a missionary call. The believers in Antioch waited on the Lord. They fasted and they prayed. <laughs> you want to know what your flesh doesn't like? It doesn't like not to eat. Can I get a witness? Come on now. Some of you are going to go home and have your biggest meal. <laughs> Some of us are sucking down fluids. <laughs> Whatever it might be, God calls us. In Scripture, it was written, and each year I don't do it just to do it. I feel led of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the year, to call the church to a time of fasting and prayer. So much was birthed last year. And, and I, I know this year we're going to see many other things accomplished for the kingdom of God. But it's not Wayne Hartsgrove. It's not the assembly of God that calls people. They, they were ministered by. They, they, set, they set aside time to fast and pray. Then the Holy Spirit said, and the Holy Spirit can say, if you have a full stomach too. Amen. But this is the process here. The Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've, I've called to them. Verse 2. And the Lord was calling them to carry the gospel outside of the church, not only to the Jew, but to the Gentile and all who can breathe God's air. They were set apart as missionaries. We have a mission, beloved. Everybody, everybody should have an opportunity. If they're going to say no, they should have that opportunity because we present the gospel to them and they say no. But if, but if we don't present the, the gospel to them, then, 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 then we're, we're, we're missing the boat. Oh, listen to me, Pastor. What kind of a call was placed on Barnabas' life and, and Saul's life? I want you to see it here. First of all, it was a, it was a divine call. Prove it, Pastor. The Holy Ghost said... Secondly, it was a personal call. He called them personally. He's calling you personally today. He's, 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 he's picking you out of, out of, out of who, whoever. He's picking you out of the family. Some of your family members are more likely, but, but you're, the, you're the unlikely. You're, you're the black sheep of the, of, of the family. No one cares about you. They, they think you've lost your scruples and, and your elevator doesn't get off the bottom floor because you're a Christian. So what? They're in their face, dropping all kinds of bombs with their language and this and that, and living their lifestyles, and they're doing it with gusto. Well, I used to do that before I accepted Jesus Christ, and I've, I've purposed in this new year of 2023, it's going to be less of Wayne Hartsgrove. I'm going to sell a lock, stock, and barrel to him, and he's going to take me up on it. He's going to take me up on it. He's going to take you up on it. Listen, it was a call. It was a call of separation. See, it was a personal call, Barnabas and Saul. And, and, and look at here, it says in verse 2, separate unto me. What other kind of call was it? It was a call, it was a it was a, a call for the work to which I have called them. And then it was approved by the church. Verse 6. The church didn't call them, but they affirmed them. That's good. The church didn't call them, but the church affirmed them. And then they laid hands on them, and they released them. Some of you folk that I'm looking at today are not going to leave because, because you've got a burr under your saddle. Some of you are going to be called to the work of the Lord. And your pastor and board will call you first, will lay will forward, will lay hands on you and release you because you're not mine, you're his. And I've heard some people leave disgruntled and say, I'm the biggest tithe faith of that church. You're never going to be able to make it. Well, baby, I hope that door doesn't hurt your gluteus maximus and you can't get out fast enough because Jehovah Jireh is the provider. We first came here, we're $220,000 in debt, and we don't have any indebtedness now. And that doesn't mean to stop giving. Hallelujah. God, I've never seen the miracles that I've seen in a financial measure in this church. How God has miraculously blessed this church. People that don't even go here. Hallelujah. 
the, the, the load should not just come on, on four or five people or just a few families. Listen, I want you to be under a blessing. You People misunderstand when you start talking about tithing. I want you personally to be under a blessing because if you're under a blessing, this church will be under a blessing. Yeah. Hallelujah. God used this church mightily and thrust them forth. God has no fixed form of calling people. Have you ever wondered? I have. I won't be honest today. Confession's good for the soul. And I'm not going to turn my collar back and have a confessional booth here. <laughs> but have you ever questioned why God calls some people? Don't talk to anybody because that would be gossip. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, God called them? God, God called me. I, I couldn't even get up in front of people. I'd go out and pitch, play sports, sit on the bench, quiet as a church mouse, an introvert. Listen, we must not ever have judgment to question the call of God that he's placed on people that are truly called. He will take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Hallelujah. And, and by, by the way, I, 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 want you to, I want you to understand you're all called. You're all called. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're called. You can't run too fast and get away from that call. You're called. You're called. You're it. Hallelujah. 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 God has no fixed form of calling people, but he does have a fixed form of our responsibilities as a church to send them. That's called world missions. That's how it operates. It's, it's beyond the tithe and offering. It's, it's, it's world missions. Verse, verse uh, I, when I see Barnabas and Saul, they, they were called. And yes, they had some natural and spiritual qualifications. But, but God in, in the calling will stretch you. He will use you in mir miraculous ways. Verse 4 says, it was the Holy Spirit who sent them out. You see, we're not in the calling business. I can't call you. I, I can't go hearse you to go minister over here, over there. That calling has got to be upon your life. And when God calls you, then it's, then it's important for the church to make sure that we provide world missions, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, so that everybody has a chance to hear the gospel. I don't want, to, I don't want anybody to go to hell on our watch because we dropped the ball thinking that we could not do this. Remember! God's got this. I said, turn to your neighbor and say, God's got this. God's got this. He's in control. And when I'm in control, he's not. But less of me in 23, I want him to be in control. Oh, I'm just, I'm just wondering, God, what are you going to do this year? Very important. They fasted and prayed. And the leaders of the church laid hands on Barnabas and Saul. And this was, this was really symbolic. Uh, just, just affirming that call and, and releasing them. I can't tell you how many times over 50 years of ministry I've seen people leave with the lamest excuses on the face of this earth because somebody didn't smile at them. <laughs> Craziness. And they take their baggage to another church and, and it will be peaches and cream for a while, but then after a while when the pastor says something, doesn't look at them just right or somebody else, then that same thing is going to manifest itself. It's called the flesh. The best way to disengage that baby is through fast and prayer. Fasting and prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when God sends people, that's the, that's the happiest time of my life. Hallelujah. The local church is not responsible for the call or the selection of the ministries, but we ministers, we are, we are responsible to support them financially, spiritually, and emotionally. That's the response. Can I get a witness, church? That's the responsibility of our church. See the paradigm shift here. The world needs Jesus. Never mind people here at New Life. We do. Never mind. I don't mean it. Never mind. Never mind. What I mean in the context is we got to look beyond. You know, sometimes God's used me the greatest when I felt the lousiest. God has used me sometimes when I felt you wouldn't know and I had to creep and crawl behind this pulpit to preach because I had stuff on my heart and life. And, I, and, I, and I, if I could, I wouldn't have gone to church that day. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> so listen, read the small print. You're going to go through some stuff. It's not always going to be easy. There's always going to be a challenge. It's what do we do with the challenge? 
And I believe the Holy Spirit is challenging us right now. Oh, pastor, get going. Chapter, five, uh, chapter 13, verses 5 through 12. Secondly, I want to talk to you about, about discernment through the Holy Spirit. We need the gift of discernment in operation in the church. Oh, I feel the strength of God today. I feel the power of God. Hallelujah. I feel His Holy Spirit right here. I want to share some definitions. Salamis is an eastern port of Cyprus and the largest city. It's a Greek city. John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. And Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus or Yahshua or, or son of salvation. Sergius Paulus uh, uh, was the uh, proconsul or he was the governor. He was the governor there and, and, and of the providence. And, and Alumus is in, in Arabic, it means bar Jesus. Okay, I just wanted to explain those things for you. Now the journey, every one of us, turn to your neighbor and say, we're on a journey. We're on a journey. Hallelujah. If he's sleeping, just give him a good one. Hallelujah. Don't hurt him or anything. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> the first missionary journey was to cover a period of two years. Two years. Two years. Do you realize that the Mormon church sends out their con constituents, and some of them are pro ball players, and they earn millions of dollars, and they take two years of their life for missions? We got the Jehovah Witnesses that are setting up camp right on Main Street down there. And I'm here to tell you, I'm going to be very respectful, but those are cults. Anytime you tamper with the Word of God and you start to rearrange it to it fits your life and only give a portion of it, I'm going to tell you, uh, I, 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 but they are dedicated. Did anybody receive anything from, from, from any of them during Christmas? Sometimes you, you'll, they'll, they'll, walk, they'll put it in your mailbox. They'll do everything. And then, and then we complain and bellyache because we're too busy and we can't get the gospel out. Less of me, Father. Less of me. Less of me. We can do this. God's got this. Hallelujah. And two years, and, and, the, and they, they ministered to the island, of, the island of Cyprus. It was the home of Barnabas. It was the place which Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark were led by the Holy Spirit. How did they get there? How did you know to come here, Pastor? Well, I, 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 I pitched a for sale sign at the end of the driveway at our last business meeting. I knew far beyond, before Gail that, that, that that was going to be the last business meeting we were going to have in that church. And God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring you to a place of hills and valleys. And I said, where? And he said, I'm not going to tell you yet. You need to seek me. Put a, I put a for sale sign. Didn't have any place to, 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 to hang my hat after that if it, if it sold right away. Didn't have any place to go. Told the church. They begged us to stay. We said, no, we cannot stay. We cannot stay. We cannot stay here because God has called us. God, if we stay here, we'll be more of a hindrance for you because God has called us. God calls. Hallelujah. We said yes to that call. Little did we know, you, you know the story, Gail prayed south. Well, this is south. If you're, if you're in northern Maine, this is south. It's south. I mean, for heaven's sake, you're playing golf in December, in January. By this time, you got drifts halfway up a telephone pole. God is calling. This is journey. Right, we got to get it. We got to be 100% church. We got to be on this journey together. I don't want to be led by, 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 my, by me. I don't want to be led by me in 23. I want, to be, I want this church to be led by the Holy Spirit. Don't you? I, I want to be led by the ma my master. Cyprus was a large city. Its population was mainly Greek, but also it had a large con contingency of a Jewish population. The first missionaries went there from the city on that island preaching God's word in the, in, in the synagogues of Satan. They went around, and then they became prejudiced to the gospel. They were there. God had released them. Re always remember this. There's always going to be opposition to the gospel. Slow me down, Lord, because I'm just feeling this so strong. There's always going to be opposition to the gospel. And guess what? There's always going to be opposition to you. I want you to listen to this. Some of you think you have friends, Right? Well, if you come to Jesus, you'll know how many friends you have. Come on. Can I get a witness? You're not, hey, all they want, hey, you want to come snort with me? Hey, you want to come, jet? hey, you, well, yeah, you want to come with me and, and live this little, listen, let's get high? Well, well, I got a better high. That's only a temporary high. I'm talking about a Jesus high. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he uses imperfect people. And I am imperfect. 
And before you get so high and lofty and holy, you are too. Hallelujah, we are, but that's why we're here. And we're not the Brady Brunch. <laughs> Far from that, amen. But we're the A-team. We're the A-team. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And the population was immense here. And, and it's very important. The witness of Barnabas and Saul was not the first heard here on Cyprus. And I'm going to about make a statement that you better, you better listen to every word I'm going to say. They were Christian refugees who fled from Jerusalem after Stephen's martyrdom. That's in Acts 11, 19, and 20. Now I want you to hear Pastor's statement today about the borders. We need to protect the borders. We need not have illegal people come in. But listen to me. Whether legal or illegal, they are a soul. Amen. And if you cut them, they will bleed red. And in all of this stuff that's going on, may we never, ever forget. They deserve the gospel just as much as somebody legal. Amen. Now, don't you come up to me after this service because I'm not going to pay any mind to you or any attention to you. I premised my thought. Because I don't want to see fent fentanyl coming over here. I, I, I don't want to see, you know, the, the sex slavery and all this kind of stuff that's coming in. Because we're not protecting our borders. But, but every life is a human, valuable life to the Lord. And in all the hoopla about that, and whatever stance you have, man, make sure the stance is everybody needs Jesus. The whole world needs Jesus. God hit home to me on that. The opposition. The opposition is always going to be there. It came from two primary, two primary cities. Salamis and Papos. You're always going to have opposition. And, and the devil is going to strategically place people not only outside the church, but inside the church. I've had to deal with that. God's had to deal with me. He's had to deal with all of us. And it was at Papos, it was one of the, the wickedest cities in the, in the Roman Empire they, <laughs> that they, they came across a man by the name of Bar-Jesus or Alumus. I thought it was Alumus, but I looked up the pronunciation. Alumus, a Jew who was a false prophet. He was a magician. He, he, was, he was an instrument of Satan. And, and the enemy will send in to the church instruments of Satan. And we must have discernment to be able to know the difference. Give me some examples, Pastor. You see, there's always going to be opposition to the preaching of the word. Let me give you an example. It's found in, in Samaria. Remember Simon Magus in Acts 8? He came against the gospel. Remember in Macedonia in Acts 16, uh, 16 it was a damsel uh, with a familiar spirit. So the enemy will always have people strategically outside the church or inside the church, and especially when you're preaching the full gospel word of the Lord. If you're watering down the gospel, then, then, then it's just a watered-down church, and it's not worth much. It'd be best to put a for sale sign on it. We can't water down this word. This word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. We must hide his word within our heart that we might not sin against God. So here's a point of precaution. A word of caution here is this. Be careful. Never. Look at me. Myself included. Never hinder the work of God. I have. Pastors make mistakes. We don't always lead perfectly. And I'm, hope, I'm hoping, and I've tried to do it here, that if I've made a mistake, that I'll go to that person and make it right. I don't want to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. But we must not do harm to his church. We must not. That's a word of caution. This false prophet, he, he practiced uh, oriental occultism. And yet we got people in Christian and call themselves Christians and they got Ouija boards in their, in their home and, and they, got, they got all kinds of stuff. I'm here to tell you, we, we, have, we have a pamphlet out there that, that Gail's drawn up. That, that if you'll see the history of some of these things, there's a lot of Eastern religion that is creeping into the church. It's creeping into the church, but I don't want it to creep into this church. Oh, if they come in, we're going to love them, but, but we must stand against that. 
And listen, these, these preachers, these missionaries didn't tiptoe through the tulips, did they? I mean, they exposed him. And these false prophets, and Paul was desiring, Apollos was desiring to hear the word of God. And God sent Barnabas and Saul, and he wanted to hear the truth. And the, and the victory is this. He didn't back down. Saul was unwilling to, to, to allow the lies of Satan to, to pass on challenge. And beloved, we must, we must stand against the, the lies of the enemy, both outside the church and inside the church. We must take a solid stand. If we don't, we'll lose the church and we'll be closed. We can't compromise. So Saul, being unwilling <laughs> for Satan to go on challenge, he rebuked that false prophet. Saul didn't apologize for his faith. He spoke of one set on defense of the gospel, a Loomis, and he exposed him for what he was, a fraud, a child of the devil, the enemy of righteousness. Judgment was pronounced on Elymas. And I have my thoughts on this. And he was blind for a season. We serve a God of judgment as well as a God of love. Come on, all the attributes of God. But I believe in that God gave him mercy. It's my opinion. Gave him mercy to repent so that not only could he restore sight to him physically, but spiritually, that he would walk with him all the days of his life. And there's somebody here in this auditorium, maybe two or three, that God has given you a second chance. I pray it's not your last chance. I pray that you will not shun the gospel or what this preacher is preaching today and have the audacity to walk out of this building back into your filth and vomit because that's where you will live. The enemy comes to be a key, uh, to, to kill, to destroy, uh, and to be a thief. But the latter part of that, Jesus has come to give us abundant life. You are special. Hallelujah. Today, don't let the enemy say, well, not today. I got to get things together. Good luck. You'll never get it together. Today's the day of salvation. Run down to the altar when the altar call is given today. And run down right now and we'll pray for you. Because God is on the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 9, when Saul addressed him, you know how he addressed him? He didn't do it in the carnality of man. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Make sure when you address somebody like that, that you're full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, he, and discernment was there. Discernment. And that's in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. We need discernment. Discernment gives the supernatural insight into the secret realm of the spirits. That's what discernment does. We need discernment. Hallelujah. Because not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. I've had people come to my church. I had one that said he was Jesus. I know he wasn't. I had others that they were prophets. And they were promoters of untruth. And they were not prophets. And I found out in a hurry. And had to deal with it. For the sake of the whole church. Thirdly and lastly. You see. We must. The governor was so deeply impressed. By what he saw. He became convinced of the truth and later repented because two individuals were willing to step up and say no to the enemy. No ground here, devil. Say that with me. No ground here, devil. No ground here, devil. Thirdly and lastly, and I'll be quick with this. Ministering, I want to emphasize this, ministering with the Holy Spirit. We need to be in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, anyway, I won't go there, Father. Less of me in 23 and more of your power, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what I want to, to be a magnet to draw people from, from all over to this church? It's not ambiance. It's the present, the presence of the Lord, the passion of Jesus and his people to be followers of the Most High God. That's what I want. The Holy Spirit will draw them. The Holy Spirit will bring them in. A needed message after this miracle with the Loomis, the conversion of Sergius Paulus. Paul is now, I want you to get this in verse 9, 
Saul is now called Paul. And he's, he's put aside as a leader. God's calling you. He's calling you. Bucket all you want. He's calling you. He has great need of you like Jesus needed that colt. Go find that, that person that has that colt. Unloose him. Well, if God could use a colt, if God could speak through a donkey, God can use you and I. There's still hope. Hallelujah. Oh, pastor called me a donkey. No, I didn't. <laughs> Look at this. Paul is now recognized as a leader. Verse 13 opens. Now, when Paul and his party set sail, now it's Barnabas and Paul, and they travel to Papos, to Perga, to Pamphylia. And for some unexplained reason, here we go, John Mark didn't go with them. So, Pastor, what happened? They had a good old-fashioned fight. I've seen some Christians meaner than a junkyard dog. Tear you apart. Not with their hands, but with their, with their tongue. There's not one human being here that's not been affected by gossip. That's why when we first came here, we took and still do a tremendous stance against gossip. Because it will destroy a church. This tongue, this tongue, this little tiny tongue can destroy and rip apart a man six feet two and 250 pounds. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. And I want to speak life here. Hallelujah. So what happened? Paul was upset. And uh, later on in Acts 15, 37 and 38, he refused to take him on another trip. Talking about John Mark. So I want you to get this. Not only do sinners fuss and want their own way, so don't Christians. Amen. And I'm going to say this to Pastor Wayne, and I'm going to say this to you and I. We need to grow up. We need to understand that, that we want to be a part of a great missionary church. And we want to do everything to uplift and exalt, exalt God. And we're not going to question those who he calls because he will equip them. So Satan wants to destroy the work of the gospel. Make no mistake about it. And in closing, later on, we see, thank God, God is the God of restoration. Turn, turn your name and say, God's the God of restoration. Turn to them and say, he wants to restore you. And he wants to restore me. In 2 Timothy 4.11, John Mark was restored. He learned his lesson. I have. I failed God. I failed him miserably. And so haven't you. I don't stand up here holy and sanctimonious. I stand up here not being a victim, but a victor. Knowing that God calls and he equips. So what happened after leaving Perga? The apostles ministered throughout southern Galatia. And Paul, Paul preaches uh, to a congregation composed mainly of Jews, but they had some Gentiles mingled in there. And he went into the synagogue. That's where he would he'd have services and he would speak and he would preach. And, and Paul preached on, on Jewish history. And, and he pointed to the, to the Jew and the Gentile how gracious God was to send his son to die on the cross of Calvary. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Hey, he's the way maker. And then the Jews, then he starts saying, and it's for the Gentiles. Well, everybody had a hissy fit. And Paul, thank God, Barnabas set him straight, said this. First of all, just like Bob Wise did, standing right here at our missions convention. He says, to the Jew first. Now, we have Jewish missionaries, but God pricked our heart to support another avenue of getting the gospel to the Jew. So, yes, he says to them, yes, the Jew first, but you refused. Now, I'm bringing it to the Gentile. So, my question to you with every head bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around today, are you going to refuse what you heard today? Are you going to refuse the, 
the beckoning call of the Holy Spirit that has, has caused you to be here? Are we as a church going to accept the fact that we must be a worldwide missionary church? And we must not make excuses. We are a world missionary church. Are you here today and you need Jesus in your life? You felt the tug of the Holy Spirit on you today to respond. And the enemy right now is challenging you, saying in just a couple of minutes he'll be finished and you can boogie on out of here and you can go back to the same stuff that you're involved in. But God wants to give some people a brand new, fresh start. Is there anybody here? Just slip your hand up. We'll pray for you. You need Jesus. Is there anybody? Oh, God. Holy Ghost. Christians be praying. Yes. Hallelujah. A recommitment. Come on up here. We'll pray for you, my brother. Come up here. Hallelujah. Paul, would you come down? Hallelujah over here. Miss Ruth, will you get a chance if you could come down? We're, gonna, we're about to sing another song. And the, the, the group had that. I, I, I'd like to call all of you forward. But sometimes I, I do that so often, so I don't particularly feel totally led to do that. But I, I, would, I feel led to say this, don't leave without answering yes to that world missionary call that he's placed on you individually and to this church. Hallelujah. We're gonna, I want you to stand and we're gonna sing this song. And as you stand, before we sing it, I, I wanna look into this camera. If you're viewing this, and you're at your home and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I pray that you have felt the convicting power of the Holy Spirit mingled with the love of Jesus. And today, right where you are, you're not what man defines who you are. You're what God defines who you are. And He loves you. And He sent His Son for you. And if you will realize that you're a sinner, and that he's the Savior, and come to a time of repentance, he will forgive you of your sins, and he'll give you a brand new start. And if that happens, contact us on Facebook. Find yourself a good Bible-believing church. Get into God's Word and be a part of a world missionary carrying the gospel group of people. Let's sing that.